now, without further ado, I wanted to introduce our presenter, Jamie Lee. Jamie Lee, Jordan House, class of 2004, is an executive coach who blends the best of mutual benefit negotiation strategies with the best of life coaching tools to help her clients achieve satisfying and sustainable career growth. Born in South Korea, Jamie first learned the value of self-advocacy from the example of her mother, who single-handedly raised three daughters while running a nail salon and speaking broken English in New Jersey. After graduating from Smith and before becoming an executive coach, Jamie negotiated as a buyer for multinational companies, worked as a head. So, you know, when the wind blows in Southampton, Massachusetts, the internet ceases to work. Oh. Uh, so did you hear any of your great bio that I just read? I, I heard well? most of it. I heard most okay. of it. <laughs> it was great. And, and I said, and now I'll kick it over to you. And then it was crickets. So I assumed... <laughs> I assume something happened there. All right, I'm going to mute now and turn it over to you, Jamie. Yes, let's remember this is a lab. We are allowed to experiment. And in experimentation, failures are welcome. <laughs> Mistakes are welcome. So hello, everyone. My name is Jamie Lee. Again, Jordan House 2004. So honored and privileged to be here. Uh, people often ask me, Jamie, how did you get started as a coach for women? And again, I just want to reiterate, my mom was really the inspiration. I immigrated here from South Korea in 1989. I was seven years old. I'm 40 now. And long story short, my mom ended up raising the three of us daughters, all daughters by herself while speaking English worse than Margaret Cho's mom. I hope some of you know who Margaret Cho is. Sometimes when I talk to younger alums, they're like, who's that? And then I feel old. <laughs> and all this time while I was growing up as a latchkey immigrant kid, my mom was like, Jamie, you got to speak up. You got to ask for what you want. You got to be brave. And you know what? When I was growing up, I would just roll my eyes to the high heavens and be like, oh, but I just want to be liked. I just want to get along. I didn't know that I was unconsciously absorbing a lot of patriarchal socialization, gender socialization that would later hold me back from seeing myself as a leader and speaking up and advocating for myself. My mom was just trying to give me a heads up that, hey, you're going to have to learn how to speak up for yourself. So as Christy said, I have blended the best of mutual win negotiation strategies with feminist coaching tools to help my clients get promoted, get better paid, even if they hate office politics. I love coaching Smithies. I have coached several Smithies. In fact, just before this, I was coaching another, another Smith alum. And she told me that for her, the biggest takeaway from coaching was that she does not have to be a ruthless, selfish, totally type A person to be a leader. And that was really profound. She, she realized that through coaching, she can be herself. And for her, being herself means being empathetic, being uh, relationship driven, being kind. And she realized she can be just as great a leader by being herself rather than being trying to fit herself into this mold uh, uh, that has been created by, let's face it, the patriarchy, right? So before we get started in coaching, I want to talk to you a little bit more about what leadership really is. And then I want to walk you through five simple communication frameworks because communication is how you practice leadership. And I think self Advocacy is one of the most important uh, components of that communication practice. So I'm going to show you a really simple framework that you can start practicing and implementing right away wherever you are in your career. So for, for many of you here, I'm just going to take a guess. My intuition is that some of you might be wondering, wait, do I even belong here? Am I a leader? Is it okay for me to call myself a leader? Am I not a fraud, right? I mean, so many of us have these thoughts and that's normal, right? Because we are all in this society that is still predominantly male dominated. The working world is still predominantly male and the leadership, senior leadership, C-suites are still predominantly male and pale. And for folks who uh, have been socialized as women, for many smart people, this does create both an 
internal and an external barrier, right? The external barrier that uh, people who are making decisions to promote other people into the C-suite, into executive leadership, they, they unconsciously prefer people who look like them. And so if you're a woman, if you're a person of marginalized identity, if you uh, don't fit that pale and male mold. Sometimes you have to overcome those barriers. And then there's also the internal barrier, right? Because like I mentioned, we've all sort of unconsciously, unintentionally absorbed uh, this gender socialization, patriarchal so socialization. And so what often happens is that we feel like we can't call ourselves a leader. And then we forget that leadership is just a human-made construct. It's just a concept that people made up. And what this means is that we forget that we have agency in redefining leadership in our own image. Whatever your gender is, whatever, uh, how, however you decide to identify yourself, like you get to redefine leadership for you. And for my client, redefining leadership as, you know, I get to be empathetic. I get to be relationship driven. I get to be kind to myself. I get to be compassionate and make the best decisions for my team and my organization. It was a very empowering thing for her. So with that said, here's how, oh, excuse me. I have a giant money tree behind this and got caught in the money tree leaves. So here's how I define leaders. And it doesn't have to be the way. It's just, I just want to offer this as an option. I like to think of leaders or leadership as defined by the willingness to go first without knowing the how. I'm borrowing this definition from my mentor, uh, Brooke Castillo, who founded the Life Coach School. And she says, you know, your willingness to go first without knowing the how is how you know that you are a leader. In other words, are you willing to take action in the face of uncertainty? It has nothing to do with your position. It has nothing to do with how many people report to you. It has nothing to do with your gen gender identification. Are you willing to go first and go figure it out? out, even though you don't know exactly how it gets done? Are you willing to fall on your face, make some mistakes, assess your results, make new decisions, and try again until you get to the goal that you want? That is leadership, right? Taking action in the face of uncertainty. And so key components of that, you got to be willing to make some decisions. And one of the key decisions that you make is how do I decide to see myself? Because we all work in this imperfect world where we will in, encounter all of the isms, racism, sexism, sizeism, ageism, right? This is a reality in the world. However, how you decide to identify yourself, how you decide to see yourself is something that is completely sacrosanct. No one can take that decision away from you. And that decision is the source of your true power. That decision is how you generate self-confidence. I just coached this uh, woman who has multiple degrees, doctorate, you know, uh, MBA, master's degree. And yet when she goes to speak up in meetings, she encounters pushback. They're like, oh, you, you talk too much. And I asked her, where is this coming from? She said, well, you know, growing up in my family, my brother and my father, they would tell me, oh, too much. You, you, you talk too much. And so I just let her know, hey, you don't have to internalize other people's unconscious bias. You get to decide for yourself. By the way, I'm speaking up because I have value to add. I'm speaking up in this meeting because I can, I can, anticipate a problem in the future and I want to address it. That is my decision. And I get to decide that my voice matters, that my ideas matter. Yeah. That is how you become a leader. That is how you become a thought leader as well. And also when you make that decision, you want to come up with solutions, right? 
in your journey to figure things out in the face of uncertainty, you will encounter problems. You will encounter technical problems. You will encounter management problems. You will encounter human resources problems. Problems are not a sign that you're doing it wrong. Problems are not a sign that you're, you're not cutting it as a leader. Problems are, are a sign that you're on the right track. And for that reason, you just got to be willing to come up with some solutions, right? Come up with solutions to figure out the how. And when you make decisions and come up with solutions, now what do you do? You got to communicate your ideas, your input, your solutions from a place of power and strength. And so I want to talk to you about some simple simple phrases that uh, you can implement right away. Um, and these phrases, I want to let you know, incorporate the principles of mutual win negotiation, right? Mutual win means that we're not trying to fight a battle. We're not trying to, you know, confront people and play games. This isn't about manipulation. This isn't about playing politics. This is about thinking at a higher level about what is at the interest? What, what truly is at stake? And what do people really care about? And how do we speak to it uh, strategically to create alignment and buy-in? Okay, so here are the five simple phrases. Okay, number one. When you engage in discussion with stakeholders, decision makers, your direct reports, with your colleagues, with uh, cross-functional partners, start with why. There's a great book called Start With Why by Simon Sinek. And also in your discussions, you want to address the why ahead of the what. Us Smithies, we love getting things done. We love addressing the what. We love thinking about what hasn't gotten done yet. When am I going to get it done, right? And sort of using that against ourselves. So we got to pause, take an intentional pause, you know, zoom out and ask ourselves, why is what I want to suggest? Why is what I'm bringing to the table important to everyone here? And then when you get to the meeting, tell them, Here's how this will help us win. In other words, you want to have thought through what is the benefit to the other side. Right? We, when we advocate for ourselves, when we try to advance our careers, we love to think about, oh, when I get promoted, I'm going to get a 20% raise. I'm going to have equity in this company. I'm going to have authority. I'm going to have opportunities to grow. What I gain. We love to think about that. And of course, our brains will go there. But don't stop there. Think about what's at stake for the other side. How do they win? What do they benefit? We want to make sure we can address that because that is value, right? You want to articulate the value of your ideas and your suggestions by saying, here's why this is important to us. And here's how this will help us win. In other words, paint a picture of future success mutual future success. And uh, I just want to give a quick example. Uh, a client I coach, she uh, is director of digital marketing for a financial institution. And she was having some friction with a, with a counterpart who was responsible for the offline banking component of this financial institution. So I asked her, well, how are you coming to these meetings? How are you starting these meetings? And she's like, well, I'm just talking about you know, what needs to get done. And I'm just telling her, these are the things that I want to address. So, okay, let's pause, zoom out. Let's think about why this is important to the counterpart and how she, the, the counterpart will benefit so that before you get to the what, you're all on the same page about why this matters. And then when you get to, present your idea, or make an ask for what you want. Making this ask becomes so much easier. 
In fact, this is something, would you agree that this adds value? This is something that I suggest my clients who are negotiating their salary. This is something that I also suggest they do. Like tell them about the value you've brought. Tell them about the value you're confident you can bring. And then pause and ask the counterpart or your boss, would you agree that I'm adding value here? I say nine out of 10 times, they say, yeah, of course, right? Because you've laid the groundwork. And then asking for what you want becomes so much easier. And I want everyone here to practice using this phrase. I like to ask for blank. So often because we've been socialized in this world where uh, we're taught to second guess our values, second guess ourselves, and we've been conditioned to seek permission or to think that we need to prove ourselves, we feel like we don't yet have the authority to just say, this is what I'd like. And instead, we often say things like, is it okay? Is it okay if I, if I ask for this? Right? We, we've been socialized to ask from a place of weakness rather than from a place of I get to have what I want. I get to ask for what I'd like. And just use, I'd like to ask for this. So I will, everyone here, my homework for you is practicing, I like this. I like to ask for this in your personal life as well as in your professional life. Because when you practice this in one area of your life, it spills over to all the other areas. Go to the restaurant. I'd like to ask for some extra water. Tell your, tell your uh, significant other. I'd like to ask for you to bring me some flowers. Yeah, it's something that I do. Lots of fun. Okay, so finally, leadership is not about knowing it all. Leadership is not about being perfect. Leadership is about your willingness to be curious, your willingness to learn. Us Smithies, we love continuous learning, right? So I want you to reframe leadership as part of your journey of learning and growing. And sometimes that means you ask for help or sometimes that means you ask for clarification. Let's not be afraid to show that we don't know it all because know-it-alls don't make great leaders anyways. <laughs> so uh, another thing that I want to say is I, I wanted to address the self-advocacy component. If you say, hey, I like to ask for a promotion, I like to ask for an extra headcount for 2023, and you encounter pushback, or they like, oh, hemming and hawing, they're not giving you a definitive answer, it's very easy to internalize that, interpret that as rejection, and then concede. Instead, I want you to practice curiosity. Just get curious, help me understand, how are you arriving at this decision? Help me understand, what is the real cause of this hesitation? Help me understand, what can help us move this conversation forward, okay? So there you go, I have five phrases, really simple. Uh, I wanna encourage everyone to practice this. And with that said, uh, I'm going to open the floor up for live coaching. So I'm gonna hand it over back to Christy. Thanks, Jamie. That was great. Um, I love how clear your instruction is. And I just want to mention to everyone, we've created a handout with those five tips that we'll share with everyone after the event. So you can keep those handy, put them on your wall in your office, save them on your phone, go back to them. Um, so when you're sitting in a challenging meeting or prepping for a challenging meeting or conversation, you can refer back to just how you're going to ask for what you want with confidence and, and self-assurance. Yeah. Um, love it. Yeah. Love it. So um, we are moving on to live coaching and I'm excited that we have some alums here who are open to sharing some of the challenges they're facing in leadership uh, with Jamie and will be able to benefit from her coaching directly. So the first person we're going to invite up is Esme. Hi, everyone. Hi, Jamie. Thank you, Christy. Hi, Esme. Um, so for me, the leadership, it's more about the office politics. Like that's one that I get really stumped on and intimidated by. I think the need, the want for people to like me, you know, I'm afraid to say something and then have the person be angry with me or upset. I don't know how to have, I don't know if you call them the critical conversations, but how to tell someone that they're doing a bad job or tell someone that this one thing was wrong you know, that confrontation is just a lot for me. So 
what is it about giving direct feedback that you think is a confrontation? Telling somebody something negative about themselves. Okay, what is the negative part? I mean, this, for instance, I was working at a magazine and one person said, oh, I'm doing too much work. This other kid, James, is his plate is less full. He's supposed to be doing this, but he's not. And so then for me to go over and talk to James and tell him, you got to do your work. Why is that negative? Because you're reprimanding somebody. Are you? Yeah, you're saying you're not doing a good job. You need to, to get on board. Like, hurry up. Okay. So let okay. So let's say you are reprimanding that person, but okay. What I'm hearing is that um, you become afraid of them doing what as a response? Not liking me. Okay. And why is that a problem if they don't like you? Because you told them, hey, you're not doing your job. You need to do your job better. And if they don't like you, this is a problem because? Um, I like having a sort of close jokey relationship with the people I manage and keeping everyone as the group as a whole, um, looking out for people. Okay. So in this situation, uh, with the feedback that you gave or didn't give, did you give? Or I did, but I, you know, sort of tiptoed around it and I struggled with it. Okay. Yeah. So you were thinking, I want them to like me. Yeah, that was definitely the background. And it was yeah. relatively obvious to myself that that's what was keeping me back. Yeah. And, and as you were giving feedback to this particular person, you're thinking, I want them to like me. How did you feel? Nervous. Okay. And when you were nervous, because you're thinking, I want them to like me, how did that impact how you gave feedback? I came across as weaker. Um, I, it's almost like I let him have control of the situation because he's the one slacking mm -hmm. off and then gets away with not doing the work. Mm, yeah. And I think as a result, well, tell me, like, how did you see yourself as a result of that? I was disappointed with myself. Yeah. Um, so let's just pause here and notice that. Like when your predominant thought is I want people to like me. The result that you have is that you don't like you. You don't like your own performance. And you feel like you've given your power and control away to this person who reports to you. What yeah. do you think about that? No, it makes sense. Yeah. I think professionally, because I work in the fashion world and the media world, you know, it's a little extra. Um, mm -hmm. But I remember like as an assistant, I was basically taught to like take in somebody else's mania and just like sit with it. So that way I didn't like go back out into the world. And so. Right. So in other words, like people say emotional labor. Right. It's like when you are not in a position of authority and leadership, you're used to just taking it in and just going along to get along. But right. now you're at this level where you have to redefine your relationship with right. yourself and with other people. And of course you want people to like you. Like this is a primitive urge that we all have as humans. I want people to like me too. I dressed up nice today because I wanted Smithies to like me. Yeah. This is normal. And at the same time, as a manager, as a leader of people, what do you truly want? Uh, I want the team to do well and succeed. Yeah. Yeah. And in that situation, when the person, when somebody was saying, hey, this person is not pulling their weight. Like, what would have been an ideal outcome for you? That the work is evenly distributed and people, when assigned a task, complete it well. Yeah, yeah. And in order to have that outcome, what would, what would you need to do? 
uh, I mean, speak to this guy, James, you know, that yeah. talk. Yeah. And let's just pause and notice that you did speak to him. You did address it. Yeah. But when you're thinking, oh, I needed him to like me, like another thing that happens in your brain is that you don't give yourself credit for having had the conversation. You're sort of beating yourself up about it. Right. Right. Yeah. But going back to the ideal outcome and, and redefining the relationship you have with your reports, what is the relationship as a leader that you want to have? Is that rhetorical or real? It's real. Like, yeah. well, let me ask it this way. Do you want people to like you or do you want people to respect you? I think there's a strong desire for like, I want to be, because I'm, I'm the other portion of your coaching, like leadership stuff. I'm comfortable and I do credit a lot to Smith. I am comfortable talking up in a room. I will put myself mm -hmm. forward and stuff like that. So I, I, I already feel respected. It's just this other portion. Um, okay. Well, I mean, you can respect that desire to be liked and I think people will like you even more if you told them straight up what needs to get done what do you mm -hmm. think about that yeah no it makes sense and it's you know it's not black and white I can still hopefully have a relationship I mean have a relationship with someone after they you know get in trouble at work but so there can be a little bit of like, oh, she's a pain in my ass. She yelled at me for this, but our meetings are always funny and there's coffee kind of thing. And people will probably think that, at least some people, right? Because everyone has all these different interpretations, but what is the relationship you want to have with you as a leader? Let's remember when you're like, I want them to like me, the result is that you don't like you. So what is the relationship you want to have with you? Um, to be proud of my own work and not yeah. including that as the manager. Yeah. Yeah. And so for you, what I see is like learning to prioritize you being proud of you for speaking up and saying the hard things, having your own back and making your opinion of you more important than what somebody may or may not think. And what happens when it's, I mean, I'm not gonna reprimand someone above me, but what happens when something bad happens, not like me too, but just like, you know, an uncomfortable conversation or someone sort of raises their voice a little bit. Or... Well, well, something that I want you to consider is that, yeah, that can, all of that can happen. People do get upset. People, you know, do raise their voice. And in our brains, what um, we can get triggered by like, by a memory of something like this happening in the past, and it can become a stressful uh, situation for you. And um, I want you to remember that this isn't about you. This isn't like when, when that person wasn't doing their job, this isn't about you. This was about them doing their work. And if somebody is raising their voice and getting upset, that also may not be about you. Right. Yeah. I don't know if this is going to be directly relevant to you, but this is an example I gave to somebody who I coached earlier today. Like she was telling me, you know, sometimes she gets feedback that she's too much or whatever, or in some things people are grimacing and making faces when she's speaking up. And you know what? Sometimes people have painful gas and they're reacting to like their gut pain and they're making a face. And then often because as women, we've been socialized to seek validation from other people. When we look to their faces for our validation, we interpret that to mean, oh my God, they don't like me. Where in, where in fact, it could be nothing to have nothing to do with you. And then, so for me to work up the nerve to clearly say something to somebody, yeah. then it like butts up against 
not liking confrontation. So it's like to get over one hurdle, but then are, do you think they're combined or do you see them as separate? Uh, can you ask your question a little differently? Um, I've worked up the courage to tell James yeah. that I'm unhappy with the work he's doing yeah. and I'll say it in a yeah. way that I want to and then would respect myself when I walk out of the room, but then I don't like having the confrontation. Does that make sense? To me, they're two separate things, but maybe I don't like confrontation because I want people to like me. I don't know. Well, um, tell me if this makes sense. Usually when, we, when we're trying to avoid confrontation, um, we are trying to avoid a stress response, like when our nervous system gets activated or, and, or we're trying to avoid what we make this mean about us. So take, for example, if I have a stressful, uh, reaction, a stress reaction to somebody raising their voice, it's easy for my brain to get, um, uh, go into like this spin, like, oh, I did it wrong. Nobody likes me. I'm not a good leader, right? So really what I'm trying to avoid is this negative self-talk and the nervous system activation. Right. And so what I want to offer you is like, you can plan ahead. You're like, okay, I'm doing this thing and it could get heated. And so how am I going to take care of myself? How am I going to like calm my nervous system down? And what do I want to tell myself when I get triggered so that I remain on my own side? Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Okay. That was great. Well, thank you. You're most welcome. Thank I wish you all the best. Thank you. That was great. Thank you so much, Esme, for being so vulnerable in this space and sharing a little bit about your situation. I think I know I can identify with your exact situation. Um, it's tough to, to have to deliver that kind of news. But I think, Jamie, you, you said it very well, just thinking about the role you play as a leader, what you owe to your team in ensuring that work is being done and evenly distributed, someone else put that in the comments. It's kind of emphasizing the positive impact of, of what you're doing with your, with your direct report to the rest of your team. That can also help make you feel good about, about how you're being perceived on the team. So I really love how you've reframed that, Jamie, and uh, found that really helpful. Um, we have- Can I just one add one more oh, thing yes. for um, Esme? One more thing, like uh, right now, addressing giving feedback might feel triggering or stressful because in your brain you you continue to uh, frame it as negative and so what i would suggest you do is uh practice just 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 writing down everything that you think you need to say and then striking out all of the adjectives and the describers so that you only have the bare bones facts of the situation so when you address and you give feedback, like try to stick to the facts only. Like James, I'm just gonna make stuff up. James, you are tasked with X, Y, Z. And James, we see here that only X is done. What is your plan for getting Y and Z done, right? So take out all of the adjectives, the describers that would, uh, that would uh, create the, uh, the opinion that this is bad or negative because we're, you're just going to address the facts with your direct reports. I hope that helps. Love that. Great. Um, so we have another alum who is here with us, who's looking for some support around strengthening their leadership style as a career pivoter and job seeker. So Christina um, will call you up now and uh, hear a little bit more about your, your challenge and scenario. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, so my name is Christina Brown. I'm currently um, a, a job seeker at the moment. Um, my last stint was uh, with Microsoft. I was a program manager for about five uh, months. So I'm now looking for, um, and I think it's a good phrase, of looking for more senior roles yeah. to organizations. Um, my 
definition of leadership has, I don't know, <laughs> it, it has, I think it has changed. Um, I was more of a supporter in a more of a supporting role. And then um, I think about maybe two to three years ago when I was um, at another um, institution, um, there was a lot of reconstruction, a lot of rebranding with organizations. So um, in many ways, I had to take the reins of that particular team in the work. Mm -hmm. um, so I really didn't have per se, even though I had a manager, um, I guess towards maybe the middle of my tenure there, um, I was the person managing everything. And if anything happened, I was there, even though I was pretty much almost like a coordinator. <laughs> right. So your title specialist. didn't reflect the full scope yeah. of your responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. So now that I'm looking for senior roles, I'm trying to figure out if my leadership style will either be um, adaptable or in alignment with the roles I'm looking for. I see myself as more, and I've said this in a job interview recently when I was asked, um, I'm more of a, I guess, a servant leader. Mm -hmm. I, I like in the way being in the background and letting other people do what they have to do mm -hmm. into figuring out what they have to do. But like, um, I'm like working about it, you know, behind the scenes, making stuff happen. <laughs> and I'm trying to figure out um, how can I best, um, I guess, communicate that. Okay, so let me, let me ask you, are you willing to become more of front of the room leader if that is what is required to be become like director or, you know, what, whatever next role, next level role that you're aiming for? If that is what's required, are you willing to do it? Yes. Great. Okay, so is there a problem here? Um, for me, I still I still have like more of a communication problem with. Okay, that's so that's I, a big thing that gets I, to me. I times. think for you, it's it's less about what is the style, and the reason why I say that is because you don't know yet what style is required. Okay. It's something that you'll find out once you get there. And for most of the people that I coach and people who get promoted into leadership, whatever, they continuously need to adapt their style based on the evolving situation. Right. So you don't have to. Uh, what am I trying to say? You, you don't have to like hold yourself back or define yourself to one particular style, I think what you really want to do is organize your narratives. Okay. I think what you really want to do is think about when did I have to be strategic? When did I have to make hard decisions? When did I have to uh, um, galvanize people, motivate people to solve a problem that was bigger than myself? How did I get buy-in from stakeholders? How did I how did I get uh, a problem solved and implemented with the buy-in of other people, other uh, leaders, maybe cross-functional partners? Right, because those are the things that leaders do. Those are the kind of skills that a director would employ. And what I'm hearing is that you've done it; you just didn't have the title for it. Yeah. Right. So you want to organize your stories to highlight how you demonstrated your leadership capacity at the next level, even before you have the title. OK. Yeah. What do you think I about feel, that? And another thing, too, um, does it really matter in, in these days that you don't have the leadership or the manager title before applying or before going for other senior it leadership depends. titles? It totally depends because some some organizations may say we want you to have X number of years, but some organizations may be willing to make an exception if you have uh, generated specific results that they mm -hmm. really want, or if you have like uh, in-depth knowledge or expertise in a certain matter, they may be willing to overlook that. So it depends. Okay. Yeah. Any thoughts? Yeah, I 
I think what I've done, and I took this from another interview I had um, late last year, is mm -hmm. kind of create that. I used the star method um, yeah. to kind of like communicate and kind of like flesh out my thoughts. Um, I may may what I may want to do is just kind of take that a little bit step farther and yes. kind of like go back to all the things I've done. Um, because sometimes I, I especially when I was in um Big America, it was almost like <laughs> a miracle a miracle worker moment for me because I don't know how I did it. Um, the things that you the yeah, solutions that, I had that you do. implemented. Okay, so Christina, I've i I'm sure I met you in the past. Yeah. And I I think we followed each other on LinkedIn for a little bit. So I'm going to come out and say this, which mm -hmm. is that, um, of course, you're a servant leader. Mm -hmm. But when you think, oh, I'm a servant leader, I like to be behind the scenes. What happens is that you your brain unintentionally creates this filter. And you sort of reject or you have a blind spot for how you had been more of a in front of the room leader. Okay. And so, you, so let's not disregard that you have that leadership skill and you most likely have that experience. You just hadn't been considering it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's going to be uncomfortable because you're like, oh, I don't know. I'm going to be in front of the room. But that's, that's, that is leadership sometimes, yeah. right? Especially if that's the growth you want, you got to be willing to do it and also demonstrate you've done it. And I want you to yeah. consider I've done it and I can do it again. Okay. I'll All right. Consideration. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you, Christina. I appreciate you both volunteering to do this. And actually, Jamie, we have a quick question. Yes. Um, about something you just mentioned. And then we have another alum who has asked to be coached. And I wondered if we could do one more. Yeah. Um, but first, Laura is asking, what is the STAR method that Christina mentioned she uses? And I was wondering the same thing. Do you, Are you familiar with this method? Could you yes. share a little bit with us about that? Yes. So STAR method is an acronym for S-T-A-R. S stands for situation. What was the situation or what was the circumstance you were in? And T stands for task. What was you, what were you tasked to do? What was your responsibility, in other words, right, in that situation? So for Christina's example, she could say the situation was I was working at Bank of America and I had a title that was not director. Um, and my role was to be in a support role. Like that, that's what she said. And mm -hmm. then um, the A is action. So in this situation, under this uh, scope of responsibility or your task, what action did you take to help address the problem in the situation? How did you overcome uh, the obstacles in that situation? And so Christina was like, I was like a miracle worker, right? So she probably came up with solutions. She probably uh, came up with out of box ideas. And she probably had lots of conversations to get a solution implemented, right? She went above and beyond the call of duty. And R stands for result. What was the result of the actions that you took? And I'm just going to make stuff up in the moment here. Uh, so maybe the result for Christina was that um, uh, something that was really impossible, something that felt impossible to do, got done. And because it got done, clients got serviced. Uh, there was no service outages. Um, the company met its goal, achieved its expectations, in increased its credibility, et cetera. Right. So to recap, S stands for situation, T stands for task, A stands for actions, and R stands for result. In other words, what was the outcome of how you addressed the situation? So that, in other words, you want to be able to tell a story from beginning to end by showing them what was the impact of what you did in a given situation. I love that, um, specifically because it's really a simple framework to quickly get at what you have done and accomplished in a leadership capacity. And, and really, that's a simple formula to follow when you're in an interview or when you're in a review with your boss or, you know, kind of so many scenarios um, that really gets at 
you out of thinking, oh, have I really contributed? And it's very clear, cut and dry. And I, I just love that. Um, so Christina, thank you for bringing that up and giving us another framework that we can leverage um, as leaders in these scenarios. Um, okay, so we have a grad of the class of 2020 who's with us, Audrey. Um, and Audrey is experiencing something that I think I can speak for myself. So many of us experience imposter syndrome mm -hmm. um, and transitioning out of being a leader at Smith and trying to step into that same kind of role in the real world. So Audrey, um, are you still here and still willing to get some live coaching from Jamie? Uh, thank you so much, Jamie. Uh, I just want to describe a situation that I recently encountered. So when I was at Smith, I usually, you know, like when I had no, I felt I had, no problem leading a team uh, and I think maybe it's because this kind of natural mutual trust into each other uh, but now I'm leading a team uh, which is mainly guys and uh, and I felt it's really hard for me to uh, it's related some somehow related to um, Asman's early question about like get this kind of validation um, but also in general I just felt I sometimes have this imposter syndrome that I'm not doing it well. Um, then I keep having this white male dominating leadership role in my brain or uh, mental uh, or in my mind and think about maybe it will be easier if like I can lead a team like that. Um, so I just want to learn about your opinions uh, regarding this specific situation, which I guess a lot of us have. <laughs> My opinion is that this is totally normal. This is common. Like I also encountered, I, before I became a coach, I worked in finance, I worked in tech startups. And again, most of the leadership, almost always see leader leadership. I mean, C-level leadership were guys, were men. Most of them were, yeah. And so um, it was hard for me to see a model. And at Smith, this, this is what was so uh, revelatory was that, oh, women can do everything we can move furniture we can be college presidents we can be engineers and it was that that created this uh context where we could see ourselves because we saw other um folks other um people who sometimes look like us sometimes don't but like um it, it helped to see that it was safe for us to be that too so of mm -hmm. course this is coming up it doesn't mean that you are not doing it well mm -hmm. and in fact i want to ask you i think the the key problem might be we haven't yet defined what doing it well actually is mm -hmm. so in yeah. your situation when you're managing uh these people what would doing it well look like for you um i kind of wish uh people in my team can have more initiative on the tasks i assign them mm -hmm. uh so like really similar to the situation aspen had like yeah. i felt really bad to tell them that you are not doing this job properly but like even though i know like it's a fact but i okay. tend not to be able to do that but also at the same time like in the end so I'll i'm just be... gonna pause you right yeah. here and let yeah. you know this again totally normal and mm -hmm. uh as a team leader you're always gonna have more initiative you're always gonna have more drive more desire yeah. for the goal yeah. than everyone else yeah. because they're just not as invested as you are it's almost like like you own it and they're just sort of partaking in it as opposed to owning it you're owning it they're not yet mm -hmm. right so expect it okay okay so if we were to expect that they're not going to have as much initiative then what would doing it what would you doing well look like um i personally felt like my imagine or my expectation for a team uh working well together will be like uh no one everyone is taking good responsibility of what they're supposed to do and no one needs to like take extra time uh to help somebody else um their task yeah. uh, but that was not a situation that. yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course we want that but let's just notice that's a perfectionist fantasy yeah right yeah that's true 
Okay. So my question is, what would you doing your job well? If we were to leave other people out for a minute, what would you being a good leader look like for you? Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I think one important thing is that to have a very clear and uh, clear vision about uh, what we're doing. And also, um, at least at my level, I'll be able to define and assign tasks to each person and uh, be supportive whenever they need help. Yes. Um, and also, like, eventually the goal is to have some good results and outcomes and feedbacks yeah. uh, for our project. Um, and it. also, I and I think one another thing that I think for me personally is very important is that I would like to see the team grow. Um, like, not only me, myself, but also, like, rest of the members. I hope they can actually learn from what they're doing. That would be bonus. Yeah. That's icing on the cake. But for yeah. you, based on what you just described, like having a vision, right? Being clear, are you doing that? Yes or no? Yes. <laughs> yeah. You're doing you're doing your job. You're leading the team. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Have faith in that. So, like for everyone here, all of the Smithies who are watching the replay and who's uh, attending live. We all have to cultivate the habit of self-validation. We work in a mm -hmm. culture where we're taught to overwork and under-celebrate ourselves. And as people socialize as women, we've been conditioned to seek validation outside of us, which robs us of our own power and confidence. So how do we take power and confidence back? We cultivate the habit of celebrating what we're doing well and being really clear just like we did with Audrey what does doing well how do we define that in a way that we can control and then checking back with ourselves did I do the things that I can control yes or no I'm doing it I'm doing my job I am being a leader Okay, thank you so much, Audrey. This was so instructive and helpful for everyone, regardless of what uh, age or class year. I appreciate you. Thank you so much, JP. Yeah. And also thanks to Christy for allowing me to speak up last minute. Yes, Christy did thanks. an amazing job. <laughs> thanks for sending the question, Audrey. I'm so happy because as I said, that was a really relevant question. I know I was listening and saying, oh, perfectionist fantasy, that is me all day long. <laughs> So um, I hope you feel validated that that was very relevant for all of us. Okay, Maggie, go ahead. Hi, yeah, I have a question for somebody who is assuming a managerial role for the first time. What are your three quick tips or essential principles that you would um, give them as they foster strong uh, relationships with their with the people they'll be supervising well tell me a little bit more about you like what do you okay. think is going to yeah. be the challenge being a first-time manager um so I have I have a great I know the people who I will be supervising mm -hmm. um and I have great working relationships with both of them I think where I'm personally feeling a little bit um under prepared is um, I don't necessarily have the technical uh, knowledge or expertise that they have around their particular tasks and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And um, so I generally, I generally have the, the knowledge and skills, um, but they really, they really fulfill niche and technical expert roles at our organization. And so um, I feel just a little bit, um, under, yeah, I, I feel like I don't have the knowledge to um, evaluate whether their work is sufficient um, and whether they're meeting the, uh, you know, team goals. Okay. And do you have a plan for how you want to address that? I mean, so at, on a personal level, like my, one of my goals is to become more familiar with um, their, like the technical aspect of the work that they're doing so that mm -hmm. I can provide adequate supervision and feedback. Um, so, you know, just building my own knowledge. Um, but I think maybe my, maybe my question is really like, um, 
uh, yeah, I don't know, just how to, in those first few months, how to negotiate that um, challenge where I don't necessarily have that technical capacity yet. So not having the technical capacity is not a problem. Mm -hmm. Most of the managers don't do the nitty gritty, nitty gritty technical work, right? It's not about having the technical know-how that got them there. And it's not Mm -hmm. about having the technical knowledge that's going to help them manage well. I want you to consider that. Like the reason why I'm saying this is because, um, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, if you think, oh, I don't yet have the technical knowledge. And so I feel underprepared. This can erode your confidence when it comes to managing the people that you're managing. But the role of managing is not about doing the technical things really well or being able to supervise the the details. It's about communicating the bigger picture. What are your thoughts about that? Um, Yeah, I think, I think that that makes sense to me. I think, um, and I can, and I feel like I can bridge the bigger picture between the organizational goals and the specific um, aspect that we need the, like the technical side of like, this is what we need you to build out in our, in our data platform. This is what we need you to build. Like these are the capacities that we need identified. This is what we want to be able to track and analyze. So I feel like I can build that. I can, I can um, bridge that gap. I think where I feel a little bit underprepared is like when we encounter challenges, because you always encounter challenges when it comes to technology, um, Mm -hmm. How do I trouble, how do I support that team to troubleshoot those challenges when I don't necessarily have the technical insights that they, that they have? And maybe it's, you know, asking the questions of like, okay, why, why can't we do this? What, what is stopping us from doing X, Y, and Z, um, et cetera. And I feel comfortable asking those questions. That's not, um, that, that's not an issue to me, um, I think, yeah, I think I'm just maybe a little bit uncertain of, um, I don't know, maybe I'm just lacking the confidence in terms of um, man- managing people for the first time. I don't know. Um, well, um, what you said makes total sense. And uh, and of course, you will cultivate technical know-how and knowledge as you learn and grow in this role. I want you to consider the um, thing that you may want to focus on is how do I understand people's strengths and expertise? Like the people, the people mm-hmm. who have the technical know-how, like you want to better understand who are the people I want to go to for this mm-hmm. question? Mm-hmm. Who are the mm-hmm. people who know the most about ABC? And who are the people who do know how to address X, Y, and Z? So that when you encounter challenges, you can respect their expertise, like Mm -hmm. tap them for their expertise and delegate solutions or problem solving as needed. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that would be really helpful for you. What do you think about that? I think so. I I think it helps that it's a small team of only uh, two or three. So, um, so, so and and they each have very specific roles, so I, it is easy to source out um, to suss out uh, who who will have that expertise. Um, and yeah. they're all they're all really great. I, I love working with all of them, so that's yeah. also exciting. Um, I think maybe my concern is that I won't be prepared to support them when we do encounter those challenges. Well, you don't know that. So I would ask, how can I support you? Mm-hmm. Well, great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a great, easy. Yeah, that's a great solution. And I've had supervisors ask me that. So yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So just to recap, what I hear is that you're already good at what you need to do, which is being able to address the the big picture goals to the um, to the goals of this small group. Right. So that's the key function. And you want to better understand who does what and why. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say, of course, you're going to develop your expertise and know-how, but I just want you to know that like, you don't necessarily, you don't have to know everything. You just want to know who knows what. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think um, asking them for like, how can I support you? And it it might be like, 
oh, just give me some space to get it done or like mm-hmm. help me get this resource, right? It may not be like yeah. help me solve this problem. It might be something uh, at the administrative level. Great. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Best of luck to you. Thank you. Thanks, Maggie. And I want to say there's a comment from the chat from Miriam who's saying as someone who has technical expertise, they really appreciate when their knowledge is leveraged. Yes. So, um, you know, you can also really empower your team by making them feel like the experts, right? And and drawing that out of them, as, as you were just saying, Jamie. So just wanted to share that little piece of validation. Um, we have a couple folks with hands raised and there are a couple questions in the chat. Um, so I'm gonna go with the order we've, we've received these questions. Mm-hmm. Um, Stephanie is asking for some tips on how to ask for a promotion and or a raise. Do you have any quick tips uh, yes, that you can share? Yes, come to my website. Come to my website. I have a downloadable freebie with negotiation scripts for how to ask for a raise and a promotion. Uh, come to jamieleecoach.com and it's absolutely free. You know, you get um, uh, subscribed to my newsletter, but of course you can unsubscribe anytime. It's okay. My feelings are not hurt. Uh, like the tips that you're asking for, I put them in a in a downloadable downloadable ebook so you can read it and rewrite it and use it. Uh, but at high level, it's a lot like this. Right. You want to think about how do I assist the value of my contributions? How do I want to articulate the future value that I'm going to bring? And how do I connect that to what is most important to the organization? Right. This is the reason why I was just telling the last person who got coached, like that is a key skill, being able to connect the dot between the big picture goals and what you're doing. That's also a negotiation skill, being able to talk about how what you're bringing to the table addresses the bigger picture goal, because that is what makes you valuable. And then you tell them, Hey, could we have a conversation about a promotion? Could we have a conversation about a raise? And you want to make a decision for what it is that you want and say, hey, I'd like to be considered for a promotion and raise. How can we work together to make it happen? And if you encounter pushback, get curious. Help me understand. What else would you need to see from me? What are some uh, measurable metrics that I can achieve to demonstrate that I am ready for the promotion? Excellent question. And again, for everyone else, um, I'm just going to, um, I'll just type it in here. This I is put my- it in already. I'm on okay. it, Jamie. <laughs> Love um, it. We'll also, I'm going to go ahead and download that from your website and just send it to everyone on this call too, just yeah. so we, just so we have it. Um, okay. So another question from the chat, and then we'll get to these raised hands here. Um, Laura is wondering, what are your suggestions? Ooh, this is good for a response when someone keeps interrupting you or talking over you when you're speaking in a meeting? So you can say, excuse me, I was speaking. Great. So straightforward. I love it. Right? It's not emotional. It's, yeah. Say, <laughs> excuse me. I, I'm not done. Right. Or you could be like, if somebody cuts you off and you're just like flabbergasted and they, they say something and they stop. Okay. And then you jump right back. As I was saying. Mm, great. I love that. Yeah. Um, okay, Leah, you're up. Hi. So thank you for um, all of this wonderful information. And maybe my question was uh, already approached earlier on. I was a little bit late, but I have a question about mentorship. And I am very interested in pursuing a mentor, um, specifically a female in higher education administration. I am wondering how to go about that um, from Jamie and then perhaps even from the, you know, Smith network here, how do I, you know, is there a mentorship program that exists already? Uh, So I am interested in finding someone who can help lead me along the senior management level in higher education. Why do you need a mentor? Like it would be helpful to really bounce ideas off someone who is not involved in my day to day activities. Uh, So someone who may have 
had a similar path that I have, or maybe even a different one, um, but really someone who can um, speak to maybe some of the situations that I might uh, find myself in very soon as a you know senior administrator in that higher education um, area. Okay, who would you be? Who would you love to be mentored by? Um. A female in higher education administration, um, specifically, I'm in the admissions. Oh, yeah, I, um, I know. But like, do you have a person like if you if you could have any mentor in the world, who would Gosh, be? Um, I don't know. I, I think that I don't have an answer to that question. Ah. Um, I have someone that I have um, in mind, perhaps. And yeah. maybe part of my question is, how do I approach that person? What exactly am I? asking for i have never wait 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 stop stop that's yeah. a question you want to answer before you approach that person that's oh, very oh, absolutely. absolutely what is it that you want from th that was the question right what is it that i want from this mentorship so you mm -hmm. have a person in mind and if this person said yes what would you love to have what, what is the outcome you want um i think regular meetings maybe monthly meetings okay. um what will they get from meeting with you regularly i don't know <laughs> yeah. um yeah what what is what is in it for them i'm not yeah. um i am not sure uh i think we all like to talk about what we do and what we find what we have what we find passion in so i'm hoping that they would like to perhaps yeah. discuss some of those things with me Okay. But so yeah, I guess I do? am really wondering what I have never had a mentor or been a um been a mentor. So yeah. what is what is it, what what are some guidelines, I guess, for um asking? If I say I want to meet with you every single day, that seems a little excessive. So what are are there any guidelines that I should well I, I'm not really sure because um like Everyone else has a different definition of mentorship. I have been in mentor mentee relationship where we just, the two of us uh, mutually agree to like check in and give each other updates like once a month, like you said. So we, we met once a month and it was really great. It was, it was a lot of give and take because for my mentor, like she loved the experience of having a mentee. She loved the experience of like being generous and giving. So it was, it was a win-win situation for both sides, mm -hmm. right? And some mm -hmm. people are really looking for that. Some people want to be um, able to have foster that kind of nurturing relationship with other people because they get a sense of gratification out of that, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I, I want to offer you, from my experience, I have seen mentorship uh, structured in like a very formal way where you enroll in like a company sponsored mentorship program and they match you with like somebody who has more experience than you and you meet and you um, and you gain advice and support mm -hmm. and I've also seen it done informally like the example that I gave where I just I just met this woman who was also um, a coach uh, she was also a, like a success coach and she had this long career and I was like, I would love to be mentored by you. And she's like, I'd love to mentor you, right? And so we're like, okay, let's make it happen. Let's just yeah. like get together every once in a while and meet up, go to lunch and have a conversation and you can give me some advice. So I've seen it done both ways. Mm -hmm. What do you think will make right. mo most sense for you? It, it could be a different way. I'm just sharing what I've seen. Um, well, in the chat, I think Karen has just um, offered to um, do some mentoring. Oh. So I think, you know, gosh, that's the value of, you know, all of us coming together like this, right? Oh. Um, but yeah, I would really like to, um, yeah, chat with someone who uh, can maybe help me see maybe what my future could hold yeah. some obstacles that may I may come up against um, in higher education. And so that I'm really thinking about if and when these things happen, I've at least thought about or had a discussion um, and uh, can be 
best prepared for that, I think. I love it. Mm -hmm. I love it. And I think you come to the right platform, yeah. right? The Smith yeah. Business Network with all these alums who want to support each other. Just an FYI, your audio is breaking. I don't know why. Oh, shit. Um, so one thing that, this is my personal opinion. Uh, I think sometimes we get kind of hung up on like a, we think we need like a formal relationship or a program. And, and I'm not saying this is you. I'm just talking about like the way I used to think about it. I used to think like if I was in a structured program or some sort of formal relationship that would be the key to helping me, you know, get to the next level. And the reason I would think that I used to think that way was because that's how education was set up, right? We, mm -hmm. we enroll in programs and you complete the program. Now you've gotten a degree, et cetera, right? But the, the, in the career arena, it works slightly differently. Mm -hmm. And I have found that it's, re it's been really useful for me to think about yeah. mentorship as available everywhere and anyhow. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like you could read a great book about higher education and be like, you know, I just got a slice of mentorship. You could have a conversation with somebody who just volunteered to have a conversation with you. Right. And be like, that was mentorship. I got mm -hmm. it, right? And I think this can really free you up to more, um, more uh, a bigger variety of mentorship. As long as like you find it useful and beneficial, it'd be like, yeah, I got my mentorship. Yeah, that's very helpful to think about kind of outside the box of what yeah. I think formal yeah. or even informal mentorship looks like. All right, right. thank you. Plus, yeah. It might be a little bit too much for somebody to be like, oh, I'm going to commit to like the structured thing with you, right? So yeah, that's what I want to offer. All right. And thank you, Karen. I will uh, contact you. Awesome. Thank you, Jamie. I, I love that. In real time, um, yeah. I was going to mention, you know, we have a LinkedIn group. We're going to share that information after, um, after this session. I just think you know, in my experience, Smithies especially are always willing to help one another. So lean into that network. That's our network. Um, Jamie's a part of that network. Uh, you know, so just just take advantage of it. We um, we we really are here for each other. So um, we also have a new version of our alum directory that is much easier to use. You can search much more easily for other alums look at it, update your information so people can find you, um, and then reach out to people. There's a direct messaging feature in the system. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll share more information about that as well. Okay, so Michelle, what phrases can you use with a manager who downplays your strengths? I have a manager trying to mold me into being something I am not. I'll be your voice here, Michelle. <laughs> hmm. Well, I'm kind of curious what they're saying but um um i.e people don't need to know how smart you are they say that to you i say get a new job sorry <laughs> sorry jamie i'll let you do the coaching <laughs> <laughs> okay uh you know i i have what's coming up for me is okay um so then how do you gracefully go over someone's head? Yeah. Okay. So mm, one thing that's coming up for me is, okay, yeah, maybe you're right. People don't need to know how smart I am, but they do need to know about what is getting done and why it matters to the organization. Yeah. And um, so that's what I want to offer you. And I, I, I there is like no right or wrong way to say this. I just want you to um, think about, okay, my manager may be a jerk, <laughs> my opinion, <laughs> not your opinion, um, but this doesn't mean that my contributions don't matter. I have a job, they're paying me a salary because they are gaining benefits from this work. It does matter. And even if my manager doesn't see it, Yes, there may be other people who can see the value of it and who, who appreciate it. So yeah, 
gracefully go over someone's head, you are free to engage in dialogue with, um, I, I don't know if this is something that you can do. My clients have, um, my clients have done this. They engage in dialogue with skip level managers. Okay. And the reason for that is not to, you know, bad mouth this particular manager. The reason for that isn't to like create uh, politics. It is to have a strategic conversation about what is driving results and because it matters to management. It's not about how smart you are. It's about the value of your work and why it matters. And you can have conversations with um, other stakeholders. Sometimes What's coming up for me right now is I coached another seven sister alum who worked in an organization and she was working on an initiative that did not resonate or make sense to her direct manager. Her manager didn't get it. Like she's like, yeah, even if I have a conversation, it's just going to go over their head. So, okay. Well, who are other executives who are other managers in the organization who do care? who do have a stake. And so she, she it was uncomfortable. It was kind of awkward, but she was coached to set up conversations with them and have a conversation about the work she's doing. And again, why it matters and how she can align the future goals of the organization with, with what she's doing. And what happened as a result was that by the time they went to make decisions behind closed doors, like the key stakeholders were already bought in on her becoming promoted to the next level. So Michelle, you can do this too. Managers be who they are. They don't have to stop your career growth. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Michelle. First time coaching somebody who couldn't speak. <laughs> <laughs> I know you did a great job, Jamie. That was, that was wonderful. Um, okay. So I think, you know, now we just want to highlight the great services you have to offer, Jamie. I um, want to mention the fact that you're available for Smithies. Yes. Um, yes, I am. So I'm just going to go back to my flip chart here for a moment, just to recap how you communicate, like, you notice there's been a consistent theme throughout all of the coaching. It's about how do you communicate your value? Because how you communicate your value is how you advocate for you, which is important because unless you know how to advocate for you, you can't advocate for your people, for your direct reports, for your company, right? This self-advocacy is the cornerstone of your leadership. How you communicate your value is how you advocate, which is how you lead and which is how you serve, right? Christina talked about being a servant leader and everyone here, we have a desire to serve uh, and serve and drive the, the needs, the priorities, the goals of our organization or for a bigger cause, right? So in short, what this means is that how you advocate is how you advocate is an act of service. Your leadership is also an act of service. With that said, um, I have an invitation. Invitation for those of you who are aspiring to become directors, VPs, CXOs. If you want one-on-one -on -one coaching support, and you want your own custom blueprint to confidence so that you can advocate, lead with confidence, you're invited to book your completely free 60-minute uh, consultation with me. This is the link. I think Christy uh, just dropped it into the chat, calendly.com forward slash Jamie Lee forward slash consult. And what happens in this conversation is that I'm going to help you bridge the gap from where you are now to where you want to go. And uh, I'm going to offer you a uh, high level strategy and I'm going to help you get to your own custom blueprint for confidence. So you know how to do it with confidence. And if only if, if there is a fit for both sides, I'll make an offer and I'll let you know how we can work together. So there's no risk. <laughs> But if this is you, if you're mid-career and you want to get promoted, you want to get ahead and you want, you know that you can take this really far with coaching support, you're invited to book 
your free consultation today. And if you don't see a time that works for you, just email me and we will make it work. I love coaching Smithies because they're badasses and they always rock. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Jamie. We're so happy to have you available to support our Smithies in this way. I'm so thrilled that we had you host this session today. I know I learned so much just from this, you know, 90 minutes. So I can only imagine what 60 minutes one on one looks like with you. Um, so as I mentioned, we will share Jamie's link in our follow up. We'll have her email. Um, and, you know, we're just we're so excited to have had all of you here. I hope you all feel you benefited from this time. Um, we host these kinds of events, you know, throughout the year. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention the one that's coming up next, also hosted by a Smithy. We always have Smithies host these sessions. Everything you need to get ahead um, is, it exists within the Smith network. That's at least what I've come to believe um, as a Smithy myself. So, um, in November, we're going to have a session hosted by Emily Jean Brown, class of 11. She is a um, an embodied voice coach who is going to lead a session on how to perfect your personal pitch um, and polish it so when you walk into a room, you know exactly how to articulate what you're looking for, who you are, and what you bring to the table. So building a little bit on what Jamie shared with us today, um, and I'm very excited for that. That will be on November 2nd. Um, and we'll include information to register for that session in our follow-up email. I also mentioned the Smith Business Network on LinkedIn. There are over 4,600 Smithies in that space connecting around careers, asking questions, join us. Um, I share event updates there so you can stay on top of what's coming up. Um, and we will post this video in our YouTube channel. There are other recordings there as well that you can refer back to from similar sessions with other Smithy coaches. Um, so just take a look at all we have to offer. Um, we're here to support you as Smith. Um, we, we love supporting our Smith community and I'm just, I'm grateful to all of you who've joined us today and especially to Jamie for hosting this session. So please join me in giving a virtual round of applause to Jamie um, for hosting us today. Thank you so much, Jamie. And thanks Thank everyone you. for joining us. Happy Mountain Day. Go outside. Happy Mountain Day. <laughs>